Did you hear that? I heard that. What was it? Could be a lot of things. Yeah? A coyote. There aren't any coyotes in England. <laughs> Hello everyone, and welcome back to Ear Read This, a podcast providing critical introductions to our favourite works of literature. I'm Ash, your host, and today I'm talking about the story of the giants and Lycaon from Ovid's Metamorphoses. I've set myself the lunatic task of working through the Metamorphoses story by story, and this is my third outing, having previously done episodes on the creation story and the story of the four ages of mankind. In case you're wondering, these divisions are my own. The Metamorphoses is only officially divided into 15 books. Depending on what translation you have, you may find the books are subdivided into stories, but they won't necessarily match up with mine. The giants may be separate from Lycaon, or both might be subsumed into the Flood story, which I'll be looking at next time. For today, I'm concentrating on a 137-line extract that introduces us to the major character of Jove, tells the story of the first time he walks among the mortals in disguise, and gives us the first human metamorphosis in Ovid's book. 137 English lines, that is. I can't read Latin, so I won't be able to discuss Ovid in the original in much depth. I will instead be depending on the translation of John Dryden, as found in the 1717 publication known as Garth's Metamorphoses. Edited by Sir Samuel Garth, This version of Ovid's book was translated by the most eminent hands, including William Congreve, Nahum Tate, Alexander Pope, Joseph Addison, and John Dryden. Dryden translated four books and co-translated a fifth. He dominates the contributions, but didn't live to see the work in print, having died in 1700. Now, on the last Ovid episode, I dedicated quite a lot of time to Dryden, Um, And as I said then, this series is as much about Ovid's translators as the man himself. But today, those 137 lines have more than enough for us to deal with. So instead of any further contextualising, let's jump straight into the poem. First, I'm going to briefly remind you of what happened last time, give you an outline of what happens in these 137 lines, and then read Dryden's version in full. After which, I'll analyse the poem, compare Dryden to a few other translations and talk about gods, werewolves, and cannibalism. Before we get started, I just want to say that the first of these episodes, the one on the creation story, is currently only available on my Patreon page. If you'd like to support the podcast while accessing bonus content, including that first foray into Ovid, then there's a link in the episode description box below. Right then, last time we talked about the four ages of man. The Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Brazen Age, and the Iron Age. Mankind began in idyllic harmony with the earth, eating only what he needed. The earth was guiltless of the plough and the valleys replete with milk and honey. The first descent into the Silver Age was prefaced with the overthrow of Saturn by his son Jove, an important point for today's story that we will return to later. The heavens became inclement, mankind was forced to build houses and till the fields for food. Things went from bad to worse in the Brazen and Iron Ages, where, as we heard in Ted Hughes's version, Man tore open the earth and rummaged in her bowels. We left a scene of civil turmoil, man turning on man, having broken loose from moral bands. As Dryden has it, the son-in-law pursues the father's life, the wife her husband murders, he the wife. Now picking up where we left off, we discover that it is not only man and earth that are endangered by this decline. Here is the story of the giants and Lycaon, as told by John Dryden. Nor were the gods themselves more safe above. Against beleaguered heaven, the giants move. Hills piled on hills, on mountains, mountains lie, to make their mad approaches to the sky. Till Jove, no longer patient, took his time, to avenge with thunder their audacious crime. Red lightning played across the firmament, and their demolished works to pieces rent, singed with the flames and with the bolts transfixed, with native earth their blood the monsters mixed. The blood, endued with animating heat, 
did in the impregnant earth new sons beget. They, like the seed from which they sprung, accursed against the gods, immortal hatred nursed. An impious, arrogant, and cruel brood, expressing their original from blood. Which when the king of gods beheld from high, with all revolving in his memory, what he himself had found on earth of late, Lycaon's guilt and his inhumane treat. He sighed, nor longer with his pity strove, but kindled to a wrath becoming Jove. Then called a general council of the gods, who summoned issue from their blessed abodes, and filled the assembly with a shining train. A way there is, in heaven's expanded plain, which when the skies are clear is seen below, and mortals by the name of Milky know. The groundwork is of stars, through which the road lies open to the Thunderer's abode. The gods of greater nations dwell around, and on the right and left the palace bound the commons where they can. The nobler sort, with winding doors wide open, front the court. This place, as far as earth with heaven may vie, I dare to call the Louvre of the sky. When all were placed in seats distinctly known, and he their father had assumed the throne, Upon his ivory scepter first he leant, then shook his head that shook the firmament. Air, earth, and seas obeyed the almighty nod, and with a general fear confessed the god. At length, with indignation thus he broke his awful silence, and the powers bespoke. I was not more concerned in that debate of empire when our universal state was put to hazard and the giant race, our captive skies, were ready to embrace. For though the foe was fierce, the seeds of all rebellion sprung from one original. Now wheresoever ambient waters glide, all are corrupt, and all must be destroyed. Let me this holy protestation make, by hell and hell's inviolable lake. I tried whatever in the godhead lay, but gangrened members must be lopped away, before the nobler parts are tainted to decay. There dwells below a race of demigods, of nymphs in waters and of fauns in woods, who, though not worthy yet in heaven to live, let them at least enjoy that earth we give. Can these be thought securely lodged below, when I myself, who no superior know, I who have heaven and earth at my command, have been attempted by Lycaon's hand? At this a murmur through the synod went, and with one voice they vote his punishment. Thus when conspiring traitors dared to doom the fall of Caesar and in him of Rome, the nations trembled with a pious fear, all anxious for their earthly thunderer. Nor was their care, O Caesar, less esteemed by thee than that of heaven for Jove was deemed. Who with his hand and voice did first restrain their murmurs, then resumed his speech again. The gods to silence were composed and sate, with reverence due to his superior state. Cancel your pious cares, already he has paid his debt to justice and to me. Yet what his crimes, and what my judgments were, remains for me thus briefly to declare. The clamours of this vile degenerate age, the cries of orphans, and the oppressor's rage, had reached the stars. I will descend, said I, in hope to prove this loud complaint a lie. Disguised in human shape, I travelled round the world, and more than what I heard, I found. O'er Menelus I took my steepy way, by caverns infamous for beasts of prey. Then crossed Selene and the piney shade, more infamous by cursed Lycaon made. Dark night had covered heaven and earth before I entered his unhospitable door. Just at my entrance, I displayed the sign that something was approaching of divine. The prostrate people pray, the tyrant grins, and adding profanation to his sins, I'll try, said he, and if a god appear, to prove his deity shall cost him dear. Twas late, the graceless wretch my death prepares, when I should soundly sleep, oppressed with cares, this dire experiment he chose, to prove if I were mortal, 
or undoubted Jove. But first he had resolved to taste my power. Not long before, but in a luckless hour, some legates, sent from the Molassian state, were on a peaceful errand come to treat. Of these he murders one, he boils the flesh, and lays the mangled morsels in a dish. Some part he roasts, then serves it up so dressed, he bids me welcome to this humane feast. Moved with disdain, the table I o'erturned, and with avenging flames the palace burned. The tyrant in a fright for shelter gains the neighbouring fields and scours along the plains. Howling he fled, and fain he would have spoke, but humane voice his brutal tongue forsook. About his lips the gathered foam he churns, and, breathing slaughters, still with rage he burns, but on the bleating flock his fury turns. His mantle, now his hide, with rugged hairs, cleaves to his back, a famished face he bears. His arms descend, his shoulders sink away, to multiply his legs for chase of prey. He grows a wolf, his hoariness remains, and the same rage in other members reigns. His eyes still sparkle in a narrower space, his jaws retain the grin and violence of his face. This was a single ruin, but not one deserves so just a punishment alone. Mankind's a monster, and the ungodly times, confederate into guilt, are sworn to crimes. All are alike involved in ill, and all must by the same relentless fury fall. So we begin with this assault of the giants on the heavens. Who are these giants, first of all, and why do they hate the gods? Well, their war, which is given the marvellous name of the Gigantomachy, gets a more detailed account in the collection of myths attributed to Apollodorus, called the Bibliotheca. Here the giants are born or created by Gaia, the Earth, who wanted revenge on the Olympians. Ovid retains this connection between the giants and Earth, but links them in death rather than birth. When Jove obliterates them, their blood seeps into the soil and breeds a race of god-hating men. Losing the revenge motive gives Ovid's giants a mindless, zombified quality, piling hills upon hills without reason in what Dryden renders their mad approaches to the sky. Approaches, plural, indicating they try and fail and try and fail and keep on trying relentlessly. Then we have the anger of Jove, and a little bit of an unintentional comedy in Dryden's version. Till Jove, no longer patient, took his time to venge with thunder their audacious crime. I find the idea of him taking his time with his vengeance quite funny, as if he's really relishing squashing each one of those ants. Ted Hughes has Jove letting off a salvo of thunderbolts, squashing the giants like ripe grapes. You can always count on Hughes throughout his Tales from Ovid to get the most out of the violence. We'll see some more of that when we get to Lycaon. But the important point here we mustn't miss is how ungodlike Jove is being. He's lost his patience, he's snapped. Dryden pictures him in a mood of wrath becoming Jove, when really we know wrath is quite unbecoming of a god. This is a crucial difference between Ovid's depiction of Jove and depictions of him elsewhere. We'll see again and again throughout the Metamorphoses that Jove is about as fallible as they come. And his anger is self-destructive. It breeds a race of new enemies from the blood of the giants. Hughes and other translators underline Jove's self-destructiveness by having his thunderbolts blow off the top of Mount Olympus as well, crushing the giants with the mountains Ossa and Pelion, a detail that Dryden skips. Now we come to this extraordinary Frankenstein-like moment of red lightning, blood and earth co-mingling and with animating heat giving rise to new suns. If you've listened to my episodes on the history plays, this imagery will sound familiar. Shakespeare loved puddling blood with earth, and here we see where he likely found that kind of imagery. While we have traces of Gaia's revenge on the gods, earth in Dryden's version sounds a little neutral almost like the impregnating was an accident of lightning and blood. In other translations, the earth has more agency. In A.D. Melville's version, for example, the earth explicitly gives life to that warm gore. 
These sons are born against the gods, as Dryden tells us, arrogant and cruel and expressing their original from blood. Still, the gods, and Jove in particular, must at least have some share of the blame for this new race of men. They couldn't have been created without the wrath of Jove, and as Ricardo Apostol points out, their connection to Jove goes back further than his thundering impatience here. It is well to remember, writes Apostol, that the giants are in fact related to Jove, being children of Uranus and Terra, born of his blood when he was castrated, and so Terra's reshaping of the giant's blood is a veritable repetition and return of the repressed, linked to the multiple castrations and power grabs in the divine generations. Because castration, unlikely as it sounds, runs in the family with these gods. In the Greek version of the myths, Uranus is castrated by his son Cronus, known as Saturn in Ovid, who in turn, in other versions, is castrated by his son Zeus, who is known here as Jove or Jupiter. So we might see the giants and the race of men that follow them as ways of visiting this historical family crime on Jove. The last thing to say about the giants and the giant-bred men is that despite the fact that Lycaon is often described as the first proper metamorphosis, the mingling of blood and earth is in itself a metamorphosis of a kind, one that subverts the creation of mankind we heard in the first story. There, Promethean fire and earth was mixed to create a race made in a godlike image. In Dryden, the new race of man looks aloft and with erected eyes beholds his own hereditary skies. Which sounds familiar, doesn't it? Jove has again lent the animating heat of lightning to the earth, but in his rage bred a race that similarly looks to the heavens, but now with hatred and rebellion in their erected eyes. At this point, Jove sighs, and we have a flashback to the memory of Lycaon, and what Dryden calls, maybe punningly, his inhumane treat. Ovid's choice to flash back has been likened by some critics to the rhetorical device of hysteron proteron, in which the logical order of events is reversed, as in the phrase, born and bred. We might ask, since Jove has already had the experience of Lycaon, why he waited until now to sigh and decide that the cause of humanity is lost. It doesn't make much logical sense, but it makes for a better story, giving us first the epic cosmic setting and backdrop of war, before zooming in to enrich it with the personal drama of a single ruin. The gods convene in heaven's expanded plain. The Milky Way is a literal way, a road to the throne of the Thunderer. Jove has called a council of the gods, and we get a sense of the stratification of this immortal society. The gods of the greater nations are given pride of place, while the commons find what room they can. Ovid's council of the gods resembles a Roman council. He explicitly compares the place where the gods meet with Palatine Hill, where the emperor of Ovid's day built his imperial palaces. In one of his most noticeable updates, Dryden drops the reference to Palatine Hill and instead compares the gods' abode to the Louvre. One eccentricity of Dryden's verse is that ornate as it is in its language and references, it has to my eyes and ears an unexpectedly conversational, earthy ring. This is because Dryden constantly drops syllables with an apostrophe, sometimes inexplicably. I don't know what is gained by dropping the second E from gangrened, for instance. But elsewhere, Jove's ivory scepter becomes his ivory scepter, general is general, and confederate is confederate. Jove even says let them instead of let them, all of which, to me at any rate, has a surely unintended colloquial effect. After shaking a head that shakes the firmament, Jove tells the gods he was never too worried about the giants, because their rebellion sprang from one original. Now, however, as Jove has seen firsthand, corruption is everywhere and must be destroyed. He uses persuasive tactics out of the political playbook, describing the corruption as a gangrenous limb threatening the healthy body, and saying his true aim is to protect the lesser gods, the fauns and nymphs and satyrs below. When Jove reveals to the gods the attack Lycaon has made upon him, Ovid compares the crime to the assassination of Julius Caesar, who will be seen in the final book of the Metamorphoses. Ovid also addresses the current emperor, as Alan Mandelbaum's version has it, And you, Augustus, are no less pleased by all the firm devotion your people show to you than Jove was then to hear the gods outcry on his behalf.
Jove relates that the aggressor has already paid his debt and received Jove's judgment. But as we'll see, when we hear the story of Lycaon, it is not made explicitly clear who or what is responsible for this metamorphosis. Jove says though the cries of orphans had reached the stars, he wasn't convinced and travelled down to earth disguised in human form, hoping to prove this loud complaint a lie. Disguising himself is one of Jove's party tricks, as we'll see in later stories, one of which has him disguising himself in order to rape a daughter of Lycaon, Callisto. He crosses the piney shade of Mount Selene, named after Lycaon's mother. Her son has made this region infamous. Now, for some reason, Jove reaches the door of Lycaon and displays the sign of his divinity, leading us to wonder why he bothered to disguise himself at all. It can't be forgotten that the only perspective we hear is Jove's. There are no other survivors of this episode that still have the ability to speak. According to Jove, just about the only person who didn't recognise his godliness was Lycaon, who decides to test his guest to prove Jove's godliness and get the better of him. Many critics have theorised that Ovid is suggesting that Lycaon and Jove are not too dissimilar. Both are, after all, kings, and both behave murderously. Both are moved to displace their betters, Jove successfully overthrowing Saturn, Lycaon trying to kill Jove rather more disastrously. Ricardo Apostle draws our attention to the small slip or ambiguity in Lycaon's reported speech that strongly betrays the parity between him and Jove. As Apostle writes, Experiar Deus, which I translated as God I shall try, could also be glossed as I, God, shall try, and literally displaces Jove while relegating him to the subordinate clause An sit mortalis, which contains the wish that Jove be made mortal. Then we have the unfolding of Lycaon's grotesque plan, giving us another discrepancy in the plot. Lycaon initially plans to kill Jove as he sleeps, but for some reason first tastes his power by feeding him human flesh dressed as an innocent meal. Some critics read the passage as meaning Lycaon actually makes the attempt on Jove's life before the meal plot, making it quite bizarre that either of them would be at that point on dining together terms. In the Greek myths, the story of Lycaon offering Zeus human flesh was a familiar one. As Robert Graves says, The story of Zeus and the boy's guts is not so much a myth as a moral anecdote, expressing the disgust felt in more civilised parts of Greece for the ancient cannibalistic practices of Arcadia, which were still performed in the name of Zeus. These Arcadians would congregate annually on Mount Lycaon, Wolf Mountain, and practice rituals involving cannibalism and evoking werewolf transformations. They worshipped a form of Zeus known as Wolf Zeus, Zeus Lycaeus, following the example set by a version of this Lycaon story. And in some versions, it is Lycaon's own son, Nictimus, who gets killed and served to Zeus. In our version, it is a luckless Molassian legate. There is a dark joke here, with Jove, disguised as a human, being presented with a human disguised as his supper. Yet another minor and morbid metamorphosis. Perhaps to dwell upon the horror of it, Jove gives us the murdering and boiling and roasting in the present tense, before switching back to the past for his reaction. Again, with flourishes like these, the oddities of chronology and motive, and the notable lack of another point of view, it is easy to read a political cunning in Jove's account. Swapping to the present tense for Lycaon's butchery gives his audience the sense that this past crime is still taking place, a useful device for Jove, who is after all telling the story as a way of urging intervention. In Dryden's version, Jove lets rip with avenging flames, destroying Lycaon's palace. Ted Hughes goes a step further, saying Jove's lightning bolt had gone clean through Lycaon, leaving his hair in spikes. Somehow he staggered, half lifted by the whomping blast out of the explosion. This Hughes version implies that the subsequent metamorphosis is a direct result of Jove's aggression. Whereas in our version, Lycaon's transformation apparently happens of its own accord. And this is one of the key critical questions of the story. Is the transformation a little theodicy, as Brooks Otis said, in other words, an act of God, an act of Jove? Or does it happen by other means? 
Is it what we might call a natural metamorphosis? If it is Jove that made Lycaon transform into a wolf, then we might compliment him on learning his lesson from his experience with the giants, where before he crushed his enemies like ripe grapes and bred fresh enemies. Here he doesn't kill, but instead gives his foe a non-fatal and suitable punishment. We'll come back to how suitable in just a moment. Then again, while Jove may have opted for a more sophisticated punishment for Lycaon, his thunderbolts tear down the palace, presumably killing or at least injuring all those innocent, pious members of the household that recognised Jove and prostrated themselves before him. We may also ask, what is the purpose of this punishment? To teach Lycaon a lesson or to make an example of him? The aptness of his metamorphosis into a wolf is signalled in his very name, but is turning a wolfish man into a wolf much of a punishment? Would it not have been more fitting to turn him into one of the lambs he now terrorises, who are, by the way, another innocent casualty of this story? The transformation itself gives us one of literature's first werewolves, with many of the familiar beats, rapid growth of hair, descending arms, his shoulders sinking away, and about his lips the gathered foam he churns, says Dryden. Notice that we go back to the present tense to emphasise Lycaon's continuing punishment. We have not only the violence, but some of the torment we associate with werewolves. As in many later depictions, Lycaon is unwillingly transformed. His metamorphosis locks him into a life of violence, and we have the sense of entrapment from how Dryden describes the vestiges of his humanity. His eyes still sparkle in a narrower space. Crucially, Lycaon is robbed of speech. He is already howling when he flees the ruins of his palace, and before long he can no longer speak at all, but only breathe slaughters. It is as if for the crime of profanation, his spoken desire to violently challenge Jove, Lycaon is condemned to forever perpetrate violence with his mouth. He who tried to feed human flesh to Jove will be forced to taste raw flesh himself in order to survive. Lycaon is used to exemplify the monster mankind has become and justify the genocide Jove now lays out before his council. Ovid's 20th century translators found fresh analogues for Jove's plan to root out evil. In Mandelbaum's translation, mankind is described as a vast cabal of crime, and in Hughes's version, the assassins of Caesar are called gangsters. Next time we will see Jove's plan put into effect as he tries to wash away this blood-soaked age with a flood. But that brings us to the end of today's story. Thank you very much for listening. And if you've enjoyed this episode and want to support the podcast, please consider leaving a positive review on iTunes or joining my Patreon page, where you can access exclusive content on a range of different tiers. Until next time, happy reading.